What was it like fighting Islam Akache? Well, uh, it's 2018. I had recently beat the guy that beat Islam Akhachev. Nobody expected me to beat, to beat this guy. Even I wasn't 100% sure I was going to win because I've experienced many, many fights before this where I thought I was going to win and I lost. And then I had many fights where I thought I was going to lose and I win. So I never know whether I'm going to win or lose a fight. And I believe that's true for every fighter. You never actually know, even if you delusionally convince yourself you can. So I didn't know I was going to win this fight against Adriano Martins. I ended up knocking him out in the third round. Even before that, we got to go back. We got to go back even before that. So I get signed in 2014. I get knocked out right away. Not fun. I make a comeback and I beat a couple guys, right? I beat this dude over in the Philippines and then I beat this other dude in Japan. And then I have a fight with this dude, Adriano Martins in Calgary. Martins had just knocked out Islam Makhachev and nobody thought I was going to win. I was training with myself and my team which the team that I was growing, right? Which was still in its infancy, was like maybe our second year as a gym. And, uh, and I was not going back to Montreal to try so I was not training with some big monster gym. I was not under the tutelage of some MMA guru, okay? I was training myself. I created the plan. I created the practices. I led the workouts, I was doing everything, I was running my gym, and I was fighting. That's not how most people pre prepare for a UFC fight. Nobody thought I was gonna win that fight. I ended up knocking out Martins in the third round. He had just knocked out Makachev, so everybody thought Martins was just this killer, which he was. After beating Martins, they tell me, okay, now you're gonna fight Rustam Habalov. Habalov ends up injuring out. I end up fighting Stevie Ray in London. Now I beat Stevie Ray, but it's not the best performance on my behalf. I was sick a lot of the time for that camp and uh, I didn't have the gas that it took in order to get to finish or even look like myself. So the next fighter that they give me is Islam Makhachev. Uh, I had a decent amount of time to prepare for this, but right before they sent me the contract, right before they told me who I was fighting and what I, where I was fighting and when I was fighting, I popped a rib. I popped a rib grappling with a guy named Jordan Mean, actually, who lives in Lethbridge in Canada here. He fought in the UFC a number of times, fought in Bellator, solid dude. Okay, so I, I, I accept this fight with Islam Makhachev, but I have this nagging rib injury. I know that if I grapple heavy, if I do a lot of wall wrestling and a lot of grappling, I'm gonna have to twist and people are gonna squeeze me and it's just gonna make it worse, right? So I make the decision not to do much grappling and wear this body protector, like, I don't know if you guys have seen like Taekwondo body protectors, but I'm wearing a Taekwondo body protector for like the whole camp. All my sparring is done with this big thing on that I can't really bend in, right? In order to not injure the rib further and actually make it to the fight. I had just over three months to train for it. So I'm doing most of the work uh, here in Vancouver and Burnaby at my gym, TriStar Gym West Coast, 7759 Edmond Street. Okay, so I'm doing most of the work here with my young fight team. Now, I didn't really change all that much strategically from the fight that I had had with Stevie Ray or from the fight that I had with Adriano Martins. I felt that when I was in UFC, everyone sucks at fighting at a long distance. They were all really good at fighting in punching range. So my philosophy was never fight him in punching range. Never fight him at 50-50 where our shoulders line up in punching range, just never be there. Now that requires a lot of movement. I felt that his grappling was dangerous, but it wasn't legendary. I had recently received my, my black belt in jujitsu from, from Faraz Zahabi. Actually, I, I, I received that belt during that camp, actually, when I went to Montreal, a couple weeks later. So I created the plan, I go to Montreal, and this was the main sparring section of my camp. I didn't do a whole bunch of sparring when I was at home. I didn't do really any 
rolling because I didn't want to re-injure the rib. So we go to Montreal and now I'm starting to do more grappling. I found it kind of difficult that whole camp to really get going. Like I, my cardio was good. I had addressed the issues that had led to me consistently getting sick for the Stevie Ray fight, but I was never, wasn't really able to grapple. And then once I got to TriStar Gym in Montreal and was doing grappling rounds with all the guys there, I just didn't really feel like myself on the ground. I remember feeling very fatigued. And I feel like some of that was the weather. It was super hot. It's, this is like July, or I believe it was July. July 18th, I believe, was the fight. So I'm in camp in Montreal for like June and July, which if anybody's been to Montreal, June and July, it's pretty hot, right? And hot, like humid hot. And then TriStar in Montreal has no windows, right? Like my gym, we have like big doors on the opposite ends of the gym that we can open up. TriStar has these little, little tiny windows, right? They're not actually that big. They're like, I don't know, like this big or something, but they're not very big. They, you can open them, but it doesn't really do much in that room. It's just so many bodies and it gets so hot and then I'm just dying. So part of that was the heat, but I feel like another part of it was just me not having that grappling cardio built up over the last few months because if you're able to like consistently go harder and harder and harder throughout your camp, your conditioning builds, and it's really, really difficult to imitate grappling cardio with just strength and conditioning. Like I was doing a lot of strength and conditioning. I was probably doing like three days a week of strength and conditioning. Most of my fights that I did that were, that I had great conditioning in, I was doing three days a week of conditioning. So I was on that train, I was going hard, but when it came to actually live grappling rounds, I was like feeling exhausted, like just feeling dead and flat. I also think it's, it's notable that the fight beforehand, the Stevie Ray fight, I had made the ridiculous decision to go vegan. Well, not vegan, but plant-based, which essentially, I ate meat like maybe twice a uh, twice a week, maybe usually usually be once or not at all, right? So I'm existing on like quinoa and salads and beans. That's pretty much it. I would make big curries with like a bunch of vegetables and a bunch of like lentils and chickpeas. And sweet potato and stuff like that. I would make a big pot of it and then I would just eat that through the like three or four days and I'd do it again. I don't care about eating the same thing all the time. It's not a problem for me. I just needed, needed it to be quick and efficient. So that was, checked all the boxes, except for it didn't give me very good energy. You can see in those fights, especially in the one that I had in London, I'm, I'm, I look kind of skinny and weak, which I was. And if I could go back, I would have changed that. I would not have been vegan for those fights. I would have eaten mostly meat. And I think it would have helped a lot with my energy levels. Regardless, so I'm, I'm in Montreal where I'm training lots and I'm kind of getting smashed a bit in the grab playing. I'm doing good in the striking. Although I didn't really understand how to press people then throughout my UFC career, I, I, or MMA career, I always had, I always struggled to press people and move forward. It was much easier for me to be elusive and move around the outside and hit them from long range. Very gifted with speed and movement, less gifted with power, although I've developed it over 20 years of practice. So I'm doing quite well in the, in the Montreal room with the striking. And after my, I stint in Montreal, I think it was two weeks that I spent there. I came back, finished up my camp out of my gym here in Burnaby, and then we went off to Calgary. Now the Calgary fight week was cool. It wasn't like the Edmonton one that I had with the Martins fight, that was crazy. Edmonton's nuts. There was a bunch of people trying to fight UFC fighters on the street, like just thugged out dudes, just walking around wanting to looking for a scrap. And like numerous people experienced that. Calgary was super clean, really nice, really clean. No issues with anything like that. Weight came off really easy. Weigh, weighing in has always been a, a, a pretty easy thing for me as far as like the weight cut and the diet and everything. I don't like it, I never enjoyed it, but I got really good at it. Over time, I really got to know my body and how it acted and was able to spend very minimal time in a hot bath and, and really maximize the amount of water that I was able to shed and then rehydrate properly and feel great on fight day. This time, I decided to do something a little bit different. I didn't really decide. I, I was given an opportunity to do something a little different than I would normally do. Normally, I will sit in a hot bath and then wrap myself in towels 
or be wrapped in towels and just go back and forth until I'm at weight. With this one, I started a little further away. I was, I believe it was within 24 hours of weigh-ins, but I got the opportunity to do a sweat lodge ceremony on the blood reserve the day before weigh-in. That would be my water cut, essentially. I would be water cutting in a sweat lodge. Always something that I wanted to do. I had thought about it my whole career because I was raised in sweat, sweat lodge ceremonies. I grew up in the, around those sweat lodge ceremonies and fasting ceremonies. My, my stepfather and my mother would hold fasts and sweat lodges. There was a sweat at my house like every Sunday my whole childhood. I had been in them since I was like two years old or something. So it was something that was very familiar to me. And then I always thought that like, wow, I'm doing this hot bath, like I might as well be in a sweat and get like a more of a spiritual experience as well. It was epic. Like I got to, we go, we go out to the blood reserve. My buddy Cowboy Smith X uh, hooked it up, hooked me up with his elder and he brings me and my fighter Jamie, uh, who was there to, to help corner me. He brings us out to the, to the blood reserve, which is like maybe like an hour and a half outside Calgary or something. We go out there and apparently the Blackfoot people, they build the lodge the day they sweat. They build the lodge, they dig the fire pit and then they sweat and then they never use it again. So for those of you that aren't familiar with sweat lodges, just a little background. Um, it's essentially a hut that is made out of willows. It's like willow trees that are interwoven and then canvases are laid over top of it so that it is black on the inside. You cannot see anything. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Then you cook these lava rocks, which are like any rock that has been molten at one time, right? And has all those little air bubbles. They cook these lava rocks, we call them grandfathers, on a fire for hours until they're red hot. And then you put them into this fire pit that you dig in the middle of this sweat lodge. And then you close the doors and you pour water on those while you're praying and singing and you do four rounds usually. Like do it for a couple minutes, then open the door, do it for a couple minutes, open the door. The whole process takes like, I don't know, um, 45 minutes to an hour. This sweat lodge was the hottest sweat lodge that I'd ever been in in my life. We dug the, the, the fire pit, we built the sweat lodge, and then when we got in, it was the smallest sweat lodge I'd ever been in. It was like almost the size of like a, a fasting Hogan. It was really, really, really small. Well, maybe room enough for like four people in there, and there's three of us in there. We go in this sweat lodge, and it is so hot. Right, like I'm, I've been raised in sweat lodges. I'm very familiar with really, really hot sweats, but this was really, really hot. And it didn't take a long time. We weren't in there for very long, but it was really hot, like stinging, stinging hot. And like you feel like you're kind of getting burnt when, when you're in a sweat lodge just normally. And this was like an, at least top three hottest sweats that I'd ever been in in my life. And instead of songs, uh, the elder was, was just praying in his language out loud. I'm not sure exactly what he was saying, but the songs usually would help get you through as well, right? Because you can like, like get into this chant. And even if you don't know all the words, most of them are vocables as, anyway. So it's, it's a, right? And so you can mimic that and you can get into it and, and it can help you through this extremely difficult experience. He wasn't, he wasn't singing, he was just speaking in his language, right? So it was so hard, but it was an incredible experience. And it was something that I, I had been wondering about my entire career. So it was really cool that I got to do it. Flash forward to weigh in, come back and we go to weigh in the next day. Um, I made weight very easily, super easy, rehydrated, super easy. I was eating vegan food to rehydrate. I had mapped out like a vegan restaurant uh, very close to the hotel and was able to do that. So dumb. Don't ever do it, guys. You, you really need meat. You really need meat in your life. If you're vegan and you're watching this, I'm sorry, but you should stop being vegan. It'll kill you eventually. My mother was a vegan for many, many years. Well, not a vegan, but she was a vegetarian only for many years, and it almost killed her. It almost killed her. Now she only eats meat, pretty much, so you should definitely change. But weigh-in happened, all good. Rehydration happened. All good. Go to the fight, right? Ready to just start the warm up. I've got me, my team is me, Bill Mahood, and Jamie Siraj. It was really, really cool because um, Bill Mahood is the, my first coach, the first coach I ever had. He's been at every fight and uh, just 
an amazing man. Uh, done incredible amounts for the sport, especially here in Western Canada. He created me, so I'm the second, uh, the second in the lineage. And then I created Jamie Siraj. At least I had a, a, a large hand in creating Jamie Siraj. So it was kind of like the three generations of our lineage together in the cage, which was, was a really cool experience. Happened for Adriano Martins, and then it happened here again in Calgary. Now, I felt great in the warm-up. I love warming up. I love the whole experience of it. I love that there were a bunch of really elite level fighters around and like dudes that I'd, I'd, I'd watched before. Like I think Diaz was there in the room and my warm up is a little different than everybody else is. Like most people are like, just like hitting pads and stretching and stuff, bro. I just blast music and I don't even give up who's in the room. I don't care if Diaz is in the room and he hates my music. I'm like turning it way up and I'm just dancing around and like kind of yelling and like, doing weird moves and my whole like MMA system is very different than most people's and back then it was like really really different because I didn't have all of the pressure tactics that now exist it was all this elusive outside shifty long footwork taekwondo and like everything that most fighters hate that's all I was doing because nobody else can do it so if you suck at it I'm gonna do it and you're not gonna know how to fight me we go out to the we go out to the fight and we're staging or whatever and I I'm hearing Makachev's interview, right? They're like playing the interviews before the fighters walk out. And I'm like shadowing, listening to this guy. And he's saying that like, he thinks that I've been lucky. Um, he thinks that the fights that I've won uh, in, the, in the UFC had been because of luck. Mainly talking about the Adriano Martins fight. Everybody kind of thought that one was luck. Even though I landed the same shot twice and I slept, the very first guy I ever slept, I slept with that same shot. So I don't think it was luck, but everybody thought it, I had just gotten lucky in that fight. That was the narrative. So this one, I think, was the biggest underdog I had ever been. I was like, uh, the Islam fight, I think it was like plus 550 or something. For the Martins fight, I was plus 350. For this one, I was plus 550. Like, nobody gave me a hope, right? So I'm listening to this guy talk about how lucky I am and, and how he's just gonna come out and smash me. And I'm like, yeah, okay, buddy, we'll see. You, you There's no way you're gonna think your way through my deceptive footwork. And I had an amazing time in the walkout. Uh, I always loved the walkout. Like, I, my mom's a dance teacher. Like, I grew up break dancing and stuff. So I, I love dancing. I love music. And I, I like to I just have a party in the walkout. Like, I'm not even thinking about the fight. I'm just having fun. I came out to Come Down by Anderson Pack, And it hit so hard, dude. My walkout slayed. It was so much fun. And then I get in there and he comes out to whatever he comes out to. I'm seeing him in the cage or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, okay. This guy's really big, right? Like when we weighed in, I didn't. Th I thought that we were the same size. I was expecting him to be way bigger than me. We weigh in, we look the same size. I'm not worried at all. Oh man, I forgot about this. Okay, I have to address one thing. At the weigh in, I had some plans. I had planned to make a bit of a stand for the union organizing effort and the, all of the fighters really against Dana White because I just had beef with how the guy had been running his business and how he had been treating the fighters for the last few decades. And I didn't feel like just going up and shaking the guy's hand that I'd been talking so much smack about was was what I wanted to do. So I had a moment where I was gonna like, instead of staring Islam down, I was gonna stare Dana White down. And then I was like, they'll probably cut you on the spot. So um, I get off the weigh in scale and I go to, you're supposed to shake the boss's hand and then go and do your little stare down with Islam or whatever. But I like did the, the fake like shake and fake like bro people lost it <laughs> everybody lost it the internet got broken for a sec that happened that was a part of this whole debacle that kind of got me like as a, to pop on the card or whatever back to the fight I'm in the cage i'm staring at this guy he's massive okay he's massive he's not the guy i met at weigh -ins. he's he's not he's like the guy that ate the guy i met at weigh -ins. he's immense right his biceps were huge his lats were giant like this guy's swollen but i had just knocked out my Martins. Martins was just as big, like same thing. He's just as big. So, and then Stevie Ray as well, like the day of after, like the day of weigh-ins, the night of weigh-ins, right? Weigh-ins happened in the morning. That night, Stevie Ray was like 174, weighing in at 155. I didn't even make it, I didn't make it to the fight at 174. I fight at like 170, right? I weigh in at 55, fight about 70. These guys, man, like the Stevie Rays, the Islams, the Adrianos, those guys are like 185. And when you fight them, they're like 185. 
So these are middleweights, right? It's nuts. They're giants, right? So I see this guy, he's massive, but I'm not like crazy worried about it. Whatever. Strength only matters if they can connect their hands, if they can grab you, if they can land something on you, that's when strength matters. Before that, it's speed, man. I got the speed, right? So fight starts and I'm using my same recipe, right? I'm making sure I'm not staying, I'm not in the 50-50 situation. I'm not staying in front of both guns. I'm staying in front of one gun over here, or one gun over here so I can predict what they're gonna do and then I can counter it, right? Moving around, moving around, hitting the chipping at the guy with my outside strikes. Side kick to the leg, calf kick, these type of things. He shoots, he body locks me and yeah, it wasn't all that noteworthy. I was able to get double underhook, spin him around, right? I have a great clinch. Right, that's probably one of the biggest parts of my game is, is developing the clinch. Uh, so I didn't feel he was that strong in the clinch. We separate, I go back to, to working again. I framed out and left, go back to working my, my, my outside stuff. Guy comes in again. I think he shot a single and then chained it to a double. And this is where stuff kind of got bad. I feel like that situation right there, when in the time where he we were standing and he connected his hands and then took me down, all of that should have had a whole lot more resistance. I was too quick to accept bad entanglements and bad grips. I wasn't I wasn't proactive enough in defending and off balancing and making this guy work hard. I chose a static head post for maybe two, three seconds, maybe not that long, maybe two seconds, right? I was posting on his head when he got me to my butt. Wasn't a good idea, I should have moved more. And then he wraps my ankles up with that like Dagestani, like leg wrap, leg ride type thing, which I had planned for this situation. And I went and chose my butterfly guard. I used my butterfly guard to try to sweep him he like rode out the sweep so we landed with my legs like crossed over super annoying um i had tried as he was elevated i tried to dip under to the leg as well and and get him into leg lock attacks because i feel like that's a weakness that the Dag dagestanis have is that is their leg lock defense isn't elite they're not into all like the new stuff their jujitsu is very old school which is very very great fundamentals but you you they don't have the newer developments, right? So I was trying to engage in an entanglement that he would understand less. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get him elevated enough. So I couldn't get under him. And he came down, boom, and my legs are now split apart. He pretty, pretty much killed my guard. And then he like slides through and gets to three quarter mount. I had an idea of how to deal with his three quarter mount. My plan was actually to go to deep half guard, but he had my arm he was under hooking the arm that i need to shove under his leg in order to pull myself the deep half guard so i was kind of like frozen there like oh, okay well that's not available so now what and then he goes and he mounts my legs so normally people will mount your body they'll sit on your stomach he wrapped my legs together above the knee line and mounted my legs i saw Faraz just released a video on this type of tactic called Senkaku mount, I believe. He called it Senkaku mount. We call that walk like a triangle, right? Triangle Senkaku. So he gets this Senkaku mount on me, Senkaku mount, and I didn't even know how to deal with it. Um, I wasn't familiar with it. So I actually just body locked him and pulled him up. I pulled him into the mount. I was like, I don't know how to deal with that entanglement. So let's just, I know the mount sucks, but it's better than being there. I pulled him up to the mount and then I realized that the fence was pretty close. Actually, no, before that even happened, I tried to buck my hips and start escaping, right? So I buck and I start trying to take him off like a pair of pants. We call it like a, like a kipping escape. But he, he had a grip on my wrist. So when I go to buck, he like redirects the force and pins my arm like way out in space, right? Pins it to the mat way over there, right? So now I don't have the use of that arm. So I'm like, okay, how can I help use this to my favor? What I did was I started walking my legs towards the fence and walking my feet up the fence. My idea was that I was gonna use that to bridge off the fence and generate enough motion that I was able to get my knee, my knee line back um, and maybe entangle him in like a, an Ashigarami type situation or, or something that would lead to a leg lock or at the very least X guard where I could get up or, or get on top or tap him or get out of the situation I was in, get out of the mount for sure. He transitioned that, that arm that was pinned out. He used the motion of me turning my, my, my legs to the fence as his motion to go and get an angle and get into S mount. Right, so he transitioned to ass mount and then to my arm very, very quickly. I felt him transitioning to my arm and I grabbed it and then hid my hand under his leg. And I knew we didn't have much time left in the round. I thought we had a little less, 
I think it was maybe like 30 seconds, but I thought we had even less than that. I thought it was like maybe we had 12 seconds or something like that. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna lock this and maybe I can just hold out here and possibly get my elbow to the ground or at least just finish the round and get out of here and get back to my feet again. He took his leg off my face, he peeled this arm off and then he extended my arm like that. So the arm that was blocking him from arm barring got trapped below the arm that he was arm barring. So he started putting pressure and then I really didn't have any choice. I, I had to say tap. I couldn't even tap because my hands were all taken up, right? Like I can't have nothing to tap with. So I had to verbally tap out. And um, yeah, it was really shitty. Super, super, super shitty. Not my favorite moment by any means. What it did though, was it gave me a great understanding of how not to have that happen to me again. I'm really good at learning from my mistakes. That's a mistake I will never forget. Don't ever let your back go to the fence against a wrestler. Make sure you have enough space to sprawl or move back to stop the grip from happening. Once the grip happens, it's likely too late if they're good enough. That's a, a lesson I will never forget. The next fight, I was able to rectify the problem and it went very differently. We'll talk about that another time. Thanks for watching guys. Peace out, love you.